Okay. Good morning and welcome to webinar number three. Um, today, in the context of the ORS Auction Academy. Before we start, I would like to um, provide you some technical instructions. First, um, if you can't hear or see me as well as my presentation, please contact the host of the web meeting, which is Michael Minter today, and just write him a private message so that he can help you immediately. Um, the second thing is um, you are able to ask questions regarding the presentation. For that, please use the um, question and answer option or the WebEx chat. You can find both of them in the, on the right side of the program. Um, for those who participate the first time today in one of our webinars, maybe some more general issues. Um, the ORF project deals with options for renewable energy support. And the idea um, of the ORS Auction Academy was to um, share and discuss our results within the project with interested people already in an early stage. So in total, we conduct eight webinars um, with different topics that all take place on Wednesdays between 11 and 12. But if you shouldn't be able to participate in one particular uh, session, all of them are recorded and will be available on our web page. Um, the same holds for the presentations that will be uploaded afterwards um, on our web page. The first webinar um, two weeks ago was about a general introduction into the project and options for renewable energy support. And last week we had a webinar focused on general principles of how to design renewable energy support options. And so today is the third session. Um, yes. It's the third session and it's focused on options for renewable energy support. What can we learn from other industries? My name is Marie-Christine Haufe and I work for um, Charcon, which is a game theoretical or, yes, rather an auction theoretical consultancy firm. And besides, I all, also do my PhD about auctions for renewable energy support. So for today, the topic, what can we learn from other industries? This is a question which is quite important in the beginning of our project because it might be valuable to have some lessons learned from other real-world applications of options. And as you may already know, there are a lot of different uh, sectors or industries where options are already successfully implemented and used as a prevailing tool for selling and procuring goods. Um, I would like to start with a brief overview of what is expecting you during today's webinar. Um, we start with a general introduction into auction applications. So um, how can they be characterized and what are the um, main aspects of an auction application in a real world situation. Afterwards, and this will be the main part of the presentations, I would like to talk about four different examples of um, auctions in different industries. So we start with industrial procurement auctions, but we also consider sales auctions for telecommunication licenses, auctions for refinancing operations, and auctions for gas and oil leases. Um, I would like to emphasize for all these um, examples commonalities and differences um, to the renewable energy support auctions and also conclude with some lessons learned for the um, um, ORIS project. We start with the question how to characterize auction applications. So what is relevant to consider by designing an auction and what is what do we need um, to design an to design a, a successful auction in a specific situation. For that, we definitely need a deep understanding of how auctions 
operate in a specific situation. So we first try to solve the question, how do options operate? And for the very first, um, we should take into account that options are reasonable in competitive situations where the value of the good is uncertain. That is only if a certain level or if competition in general is given, options can be successfully implemented. I mean, this is quite obvious. If you have fewer buyers than goods to be sold, an auction would make no sense because the bidders will have incentives to bid excessively high prices, for example. So in a sales auction, demand always has to exceed the supply and supply has to exceed demand in procurement auctions. The other point that the value of the good has to be uncertain is important um, from more or less from an auctioneer's perspective because if the auctioneer would already know an appropriate price of the good to be auctioned, he wouldn't have to face the effort of conducting an auction. Then he could just buy or sell the good at the, the corresponding price. So an auction also um, serves to generate information about competitive prices for the auction. In the figure here, you see the four main aspects of, characteriza of, the, of, characteriza of the characterization of auctions. So we start with the good specification. So in a first step, you should um, define what actually is auctioned. And is it one product or is it, um, are there several products to be sold or bought? Or bought. Um, in the next step, you um, have a look on the market conditions. So who is interested in those goods? Who will participate in the auction? And how are the, um, the information of the participants, for example? Another important aspect are the goals, um, especially the aims of the, the auction here. So what is he hoping to achieve by conducting an auction? Is it just profit maximization? So does he aim to, does he aim to um, sell goods at a high price or buy them at a low price? Or has he further goals like, for example, efficiency? So is he also interested in finding an appropriate buyer or supplier? Um, then the next and maybe most important uh, aspect is the auction format itself. So if we conduct a static or dynamic auction, for example, or which kind of pricing rule we choose. And the auction format is or plays a kind of key role in this figure because the auction format has to incorporate the market conditions and also trigger incentives that um, lead to the predefined goals. So the auction format is a kind of um, bridge between market conditions and goals. And so it not only has to fit to the particular market situation, but it also has to fit to the uh, predefined goals by the auctioneer. So as you can imagine, it might be quite complex to find an appropriate auction format in, in, uh, in a specific situation. Um, let's come to the aspects in particular, starting with the good specification. So the first question is, what is auction? Is it just one good or uh, do we have multiple goods? In case of multiple goods, we have to distinguish between homogeneous and heterogeneous goods. That is, do we have um, similar or equivalent goods, which is the case uh, for the homogeneous one, or do we have uh, heterogeneous, that means different uh, goods. This is the first distinction. And in the next step, we uh, differ between supplementary and complementary uh, use of goods. So for example, if we have homogeneous substitutes, these are the same product, but they can be replaced by each other. So for example, if you have two identical pens, since you can only write with one pen at the time, these two pens are interchangeable. And so we would characterize these two different, these two identical pens as 
homogeneous substitutes. Um, if we have com complementary use of products, we um, will benefit from having both products, for example, instead of having each of them separately. So, for example, if we um, imagine, you could imagine a, a, a pair of shoes. If I have only one shoe, I nearly have a utility of, of zero, so I cannot do anything with just one shoe. But if I have another, these both complement each other, and I have a utility of, of having both, which is quite higher of having either the left or the right one. For the heterogeneous goods, we also distinguish between a supplementary and a complementary use. So for the heterogeneous substitutes, an example would be um, two um, different vehicles, for example, a bike and a car, and I can only use one of them to go to work, for example. So these are um, substitutive but heterogeneous goods. And an example, finally, for the heterogeneous complements would be um, a cup and a saucer. So um, the first step would be to specify the good and not only from the auctioneer's perspective, but also from the bidder's perspective. So it may be that the auctioneer has a different good specification as the bidder. And this, of course, has to be taken into account before designing the auction. Um, further, there might be um, relevant, we have to think about the relevant parameters for the valuation of the good. So I think the most obvious is the price. So the price often um, serves as a sole criterion uh, in auctions or for buying or selling processes. But um, often we also have the situation where quality also matters. So for example, in a procurement auction, as you could imagine, not only the, the, the price of the product is important, but also the quality. And finally, um, it's important to to know about uncertainties in the valuation of the goods. So do the auctioneer and the bidder, are they certain about their valuation or do they face any kind of uncertainties regarding the valuation of the goods? Um, now we come to the market conditions. So in the first step, we have to ask who participates in the auction. How many bidders do we have? So this is obviously important for the um, level of competition. Um, another point is how well do um, the bidders know each other? So this refers to the market transparency. If we have a high tra market transparency that the bidders know each other very well, um, we will have, um, this may facilitate collusion, for example. And um, then the experienced or unexperienced bidders. This might be important um, regarding the question of implementing a rather simple auction format or a more complex one in order to maybe avoid um, irrational bidding behavior. Then we all should distinguish between symmetric and asymmetric bidders, um, what means that uh, bidders can be differently strong. So we can have very similar, similarly uh, strong bidders are very high discrepancies in the bidder strength. And also regarding the risk attitude of the bidders, we can have um, relevant uh, differences between bidders, which might be important uh, for impacting the individual bidding behavior. Then we also have to question what purpose uh, do they, for what purpose do the participants um, participate in the auction. So is it just profit maximization from a bidder's perspective? So do they aim to buy at low prices or sell at high prices in the auction? Which is, I think, the, the, should be the main reason and is the most obvious one. Or are there other interests? First, are they interested in one or multiple goods in case of a multi-unit auction? Or are there further interests, like, um, for example, do they just participate with the intention to block their competitors? Um, 
Then we also have to, to think of interdependencies between several awards. So this is what we mentioned, uh, what I mentioned before. This is a supplementary and complementary use of goods. So are there maybe any kinds of economies of scale or capacity constraints um, for the bidders? And finally, we also have to think about um, if bidders have incentives for collusion in the auction. Then we also should um, regard um, what information do the participants have considering the good. So do they have different information about the good or are they rather similar? And this is what you already uh, heard before, are there some kinds of uh, uncertainties regarding the valuation of the good. And finally, and this is I think the most interesting uh, point here is since we um, answered all the questions rather from an optimist perspective, so what does he think about the market conditions, we also have to um, ask the question, what do the participants think about the market conditions? So what do the participants know or believe about each other? So what do they think who participates in the auction and for what purpose and with what information? And then in the next step, they should ask, okay, what do my uh, competitors think that I think about them and so on? And this is um, like a never ending circle which will lead to, a, um, to the game theoretical approach we are working with. So this is quite complex, but is really important to understand how the market works. Um, now we come to the goals. So the auctioneer has normally three main goals, which is the expected auction revenue, so a kind of profit maximization, but also effectiveness. So in the renewable energy support context, for example, if, 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 the, if the auctioneer implements the auction he aims to um, to achieve his expansion targets. So this is um, meant by effectiveness, but also efficiency may play a crucial role. Um, would mean that the auction here aims to um, award um, appropriate um, bidders. Further goals could be, um, especially um, with regard to real world applications, the public acceptance of the auction and a certain kind of security and reliability um, represented by the auction. So this is especially important for real-world applications. And another goal could be a high participation, that means a high um, competition level, which is always uh, favorable for a successful auction, but also um, the the preservation of a certain access diversity might be in a, a further goal by conducting an auction. And also mitigating collusion, for example. So these goals are more or less um, in the, um, in, um, depend on, on, them, the, on the main goals. Um, yes, yeah, so far we talked about the market conditions and about the goals, so now we know where we are and where to go, but we do not know the way yet. So now we come to the auction format, which should, as I already said, build a bridge between market conditions and goals. But we have to, to uh, consider several points here first. Um, bidders behave differently in different auction formats. And this means that the same auction format conducted under different market conditions may lead to completely different outcomes. So it is very essential to understand the market very, very well in order to, to avoid um, a misimplementation of a certain auction format. Then, from another perspective, different auction formats conducted under the same market conditions may lead to completely different outcomes. That is, it is also important to understand the auction formats very, very well and to know specific pros and cons of particular auction forms in order to find the appropriate one in a specific situation. 
Um, as a consequence, there is a high ambiguity regarding the ranking of various option formats. So it cannot be said that there is one option format which performs with a certain higher probability always better than another. Um, finally, a suitable option mechanism has to adequately incorporate the given market conditions on the one side, and on the other side, it has to trigger incentives that lead to the predetermined goals on the other side. So, however, the optimal way is a balancing act, as you can already Im imagine now. So, let's start with the examples. So, first, the industrial procurement options that um, more and more replace um, bilateral um, negotiation processes in several industries. That is, if a firm decided to procure um, several goods, they start conducting auctions instead of um, meeting potential suppliers one after another and, and, and discard their specific offers uh, individually. This may lead or auctions may offer um, a more structured process and consequently lead to a higher transparency um, in the procurement process. So it might be easier with auctions for the for the firms to, to compare different offers against each other. And as you can imagine, in a procurement situation, not only the price may be relevant for the award, but the firms are also interested in the quality of the of the product they are planning to procure. So procurement options are normally um, multi-criteria options. That is options in which not only the price is a sole criterion, but further relevant criteria are um, considered um, for the award. So I would like to start with an example where we have a two-dimensional award parameter. That is, we have two parameters which are relevant for the award. Um, the company XY plans to procure two goods, A and B, where the award is based on first the procurement costs. So, of course, the company aims to buy at low prices, but um, also quality matters. And the quality is evaluated by a quality parameter Q, which is between zero and one, where zero is um, represents a high quality and two, and two um, if Q is one, um, that represents a low quality. So you can think of this parameter as a kind of bonus, like a cost reduction in case of a higher quality. Um, we have three pot potential suppliers here that have added um, additive cost structures what means that uh, producing good A and good B separately in some would have the same cost as producing good A and B um, simultaneously. So there are no economies of scale or things like that. Further, we have um, the goal of single sourcing here. That is, the company XY only wants to award one supplier. So he, they aim to um, buy good A and B from the same supplier, so either one, two, and three. They are not willing to, to split the, the award among several suppliers. So and here on the table, you see um, that supplier one submitted a price of 100 and had a quality of one. So in total, um, he got a score of 100, 100, since price and quality are just multiplied. For good B, he provided a price of 55, had a quality of one and two, and so he had also a score of uh, 55, and in total, um, a score of 155. Supplier 2 had a higher price for good A, 120, than supplier 1, but he had a better quality of uh, 1.8, so he had a score of 96, and so on. So as a result, supplier 3 will be awarded since the um, relevant um, line for the award decision is the score for good A and B. 
And as you can see, supplier 3 had the lowest score for good A and B. He has a score of 125, and so he is the one who will be awarded. But please mention here that although supplier 3 has the lowest score, um, the company will pay the highest price for both. So they will pay 170 instead of 150 if price prices would be the sole criterion. But supplier three has a, um, a better quality, so because of the score, supplier three will be awarded in the end. So finally, the auctioneer benefits from taking into account multiple goals adequately by an increased efficiency. So in the end, he, he had chosen the better or the best supplier um, for him. In the next example, I would uh, demonstrate, would like to demonstrate the difference between single and no single. So this is basically the same example with the same numbers, but here we don't have um, the the aim of single sourcing. So the bid, the goods could be delivered from several suppliers. So the relevant line for the award decision is here the score of good A and the supplier 2 has the lowest score of 96. And for good B, the lowest score is uh, 27. So supplier 2 will deliver good A and supplier 3 will deliver good B. So they often benefit from buying the goods from different suppliers by a further increased efficiency. So in total, we have then a score of 123 compared to 125 as well as lower procurement costs. So in total, um, the company pays um, 150 instead of 170 before with the single sourcing or instead of 155 in case of single sourcing with um, price as sole criteria. So I hope it became clear that the form of the auction format and the um, especially the good specification and the evaluation of, of bits and quality or prices and quality might be crucial in finding an appropriate uh, supplier in procurement auctions. So now we have a, look, a general look on uh, industrial procurement auctions with um, regard to the form Characteristical aspects. So, first, the good specification. Normally, um, there are long term contracts auctions, auctioned that is a high volume of um, products, and the products may differ between, between each other, where the use can either be supplementary or complementary. And there are often highly innovative goods auctioned in procurement auctions that is. Um, quite clear before the background of that auctions um, are especially suitable in situations where a clear market price is not given, which is definitely the case if the goods are highly innovative. Um, then the goals of the auction and industrial procurement auctions is first price discovery, so because they don't have this clear market price, but also price reduction. So they aim to, to uh, procure at low prices, of course. But besides the, the profit maximization goal, they also have the goal of selecting an appropriate supplier. So they want to find some uh, suppliers that deliver the, um, the necessary quality and that fit best to their specific conditions. Um, then we have the market conditions. In this case, um, we have a relatively small number of suppliers and bidders that know each other very well. So since the firms normally um, had a long-term relationship to their suppliers and have worked with each other, and in the past they know them very, very well, which is um, not given in all other cases. And then we have the asymmetric information uh, problem, which is given between auctioneer and bidders. And we may also have asymmetric synergies uh, between several goods among bidders. So they may have different kind of uses uh, for the product. And also the quality may differ between suppliers, as we have already seen in the example. 
Then uh, the auction format. Normally, um, the procurement auctions are one-time auctions since the products are very, very specific and auctioned for a long time. Um, we have to, to evaluate them as a one-time auction. Um, the multi, normally, these are multi-criteria auctions where the goals are monetarily uh, quantified. Um, and we also often have multi-stage auctions, so that we have something like a um, pre-qualification process where bidders submit uh, bids, and then we have a, something like a um, competition phase where not all bidders are allowed to, to enter the phase. Um, another interesting point in the, in the case of industrial procurement auctions is that sometimes um, we have um, the question of favoritism. So if a firm, for example, has something like a long-term supplier and he wants to give him an, uh, a special position in the procurement process, there are several methods to, um, to favor this supplier in the particular auction. In general, um, we could observe that industrial procurement auctions had an increased implementation in the past. So compared to the renewable energy support uh, context, um, we see some commonalities. For example, um, the long-term contract, this is also the case in the renewable energy support option, where the support is um, given for, for example, 20 years. So this is, uh, this is quite similar. Also the goals um, in the renewable energy support option, price discovery, price discovery and reduction play a crucial role since the government wants to um, wants to to generate a, um, competitive prices through the auctions. And also the selection of appropriate suppliers is, is a common goal. Um, the market conditions are a little bit uh, different. So in the renewable energy support context, we don't have a small number of well-known suppliers. So the auction normally has not that good information about the renewable energy firms than the companies have in the industrial procurement auctions about potential um, uh, participants. Then we also have the asymmetric information problem that if the government is um, not that good informed about um, expected costs and revenues of the renewable energy um, projects, but the, the builders have the better information. Then the quality may differ between renewable energy support and projects, um, which is due to different geographical um, conditions, for example. And then finally, the auction format, and this is one of the most um, essential differences in, in, the, in this com comparison, we don't have a one-time auction in the renewable energy support context. So this is very crucial because a repeated um, auction conduction will facilitate collusion, will lead to, um, to learning effects among bidders and so on. So this is a quite uh, crucial difference. But however, we um, we were able to do some lessons learned, to find some lessons learned or some conclusions um, for, during the comparison. First, I would like to mention that the very specific auction design in the industrial procurement auction is due to the one-time auction and that the auctioneer um, has very valuable information about the market structure. So he has a very, very good um, overview of what is happening in the market, which is not the case for the renewable energy support context. Um, lessons learned that can be taken, definitely, but only for particular design elements. For example, the multi-criteria approach, so how to incorporate several goals in the auction, or the multi-stage multi auction, so we can identify uh, typical benefits and pitfalls. Um, in the industrial procurement auction. Then we can learn something about bundling and splitting. So what could be at, how could the auction benefit from bundling or splitting? And we could also learn um, about the handling of suppliers or bidders 
from various cultural backgrounds and with different experiences regarding options. So now we come to the second example, um, which are the safe options for telecommunication licenses. So basically during the 1990s, the safe options for telecommunication licenses um, attracted um, worldwide attention. So the first options were done in, uh, in New Zealand, but then also the United States, India, and several European countries started to, to, sell, to sell telecommunication licenses via auctions. Before, there were several um, other methods to, to sell um, telecommunication licenses. The most common were um, administrative processes, but there were also lotteries or first come, first serve methods. However, finally, in the end, it turned out that um, auctions seem to be the most um, appropriate one. So, for this case, I would like to draw your attention to the um, European UMTS auctions that took place in 2000 and 2001 and were one of the largest in history. So, um, the, these European uh, UMTS auctions generated enormous differences in the revenues between countries, although before um, experts um, found that the conditions in the particular countries are very, very similar. So the valuations for the licenses in the different countries were roughly constant. However, and this is due to um, misimplementations of auctions in some cases, um, the auctions in the different countries lead to completely different auction outcomes. So I would like to start with the German UMTS auction in 2001. So this was a simultaneous scanning clock auction. So bidders could submit uh, their bids for several blocks, and then um, the prices um, increased uh, simultaneously. So in total, 12 blocks of spectrum were auctioned, and you could either um, receive a two-block license, so there were six, in total six two-block licenses, or you could receive a three-block licenses. This is, um, you, in total you had four of these bigger license blocks. Um, in total we had seven participants, which was I mentioned before that it was, uh, um, that they expected uh, actually a higher competition, so this were a very small number of, of participants. And Further, two of these seven participants were very dominant. So the Deutsche Telekom and Mannesmann, which had both 40% of the market share, um, were very dominant. In total, they had 80% of the market. So what, what the majority expected was that those two would aim to, to get a bigger license. So those two would bid on the three block licenses and put weaker ones out of the market. But this didn't happen in the end. So bidders um, succeeded to collude in favor of relatively low prices. So in the end, we had uh, six successful bidders, which each had a two-block license. Um, so what we could observe here, observe here is that the two dominant incumbents conducted so-called strategic demand reduction. So they were satisfied with a smaller license in favor of lower prices. I think in the second example, the Austrian case, this becomes um, a little bit more clear. So in the Austrian case, we basically had the same setting as in the German one, but here we had only six participants. And also these 12 blocks were optioned and we could either have four bigger license blocks or six of the smaller ones. And of course what, what happens 
all the six participants were awarded and each of them got a two block license um, at a very, very low price where we only had this 100, 100 euro per capita in comparison to the um, 615 before in the German case. So this is a very um, impressive uh, example of a collusion towards strategic demand reduction. So because of the low, um, the small number of participants, the risk of strategic demand reduction was um, enormously emphasized in the Austrian case and as a consequence, extremely low auction revenue um, was, was generated for the government. So for the um, general um, characterization of sales auctions, we also have this uh, four aspects here. The good specification in the telecommunication license uh, auction is that we have licenses for different predetermined uh, frequency, which is more or less a small volume. And we also have long-term contracts since they are valid for 15 years. And we have it depends on what exactly is auctioned, if we have a supplementary or complementary use of goods. The goals here are also efficiencies so the government aims to select appropriate uh, suppliers. We have or may have uh, the goal of maximization of revenue, but definitely we have a goal of uh, price discovery. I think the government is not able to, to or has not the information that the bidders have about the uh, potential prices of licenses. Um, the market conditions are rather a yeah, small number of bidders, so often the telecommunication license options have high pre-qualification criteria so that only a small number of, of bidders can, um, can uh, qualify for the option. Then we have a high transparency, which is due to the small number of bidders, and we also have the asymmetric information that bidders are better informed than the auctioneers. Um, from a, the auction format perspective, we have a state-run auction, and it's also a one-time auction where normally um, the countries conduct dynamic auctions with different formats. So this is uh, this depends on on the on the specific country. Um, as, of, as already mentioned, normally we have strong pre-qualification pre criteria here, so the firms have to prove that they are able to um, to um, operate the licenses adequately. Um, further, we have a penalty, which uh, become uh, relevant in case of cancellation of licenses um, if they do not uh, realize the um, the license. Um, also here, it's an uh, international standard that auctions are conducted for the telecommunication licenses. So in comparison to the renewable energy support uh, auctions, we have long-term contracts, as already before. We have um, the goal of efficiency, so those renewable energy support uh, um, renewable energy plans should be supported that can do it best. Um, then we have the goal of price discovery here and also the asymmetric information. And yes, the renewable energy support auctions are also a state run auction, so government is conducting the auction. Um, differences are the small number of bidders, which is not the case in the renewable energy um, situation, and we have a high transparency which is also not necessarily given. Um, further, we also have here a one-time auction, which is not the case in the um, renewable energy case. Um, nevertheless, the conclusion, um, interdependencies between valuations and or use of goods have to be taken into account by an adequate bid specification. This is what went wrong in, in the second example, where um, in the Austrian case, if you, if you uh, remember. Um, this is something more or less general, uh, a general lessons learned from this kind of auction. Then dynamic auctions facilitate collusive behavior, especially before the background of repeated auction with same participants. So this might be um, especially um, 
crucial in the case of renewable energy, that dynamic options and repeated options will somehow in two ways facilitate collusive behavior. Then we have the market transparency, which facilitates collusive behavior at the expense of the option use profit. But this has to be um, checked individually for renewable energy, if there is a high market transparency or not. Okay, then we come to the options for refinancing operations. There we had two different variants uh, that were implemented in the past. First we had uh, the fixed rate tenders and later we had the variable rate tenders. And I would like to start with the fixed rate tender in the example. So a fixed rate tender was that a fixed interest rate of, for example, three percent pre-announced by the European Central Bank was um, was given, and then the bank submitted bids representing their demand of money at the given interest rate. So this is uh, quite similar. They had this fixed interest rate given and just said how much money they would be they, they would uh, like to have for this uh, for this rate. Then the bids are awarded until the demand of money meets supply. So this is uh, quite uh, Normal, but and this is the crucial point here that in case that demand exceeds supply, that is, the banks would like to have more money than the um, European Central Bank would offer them, then the bidders were awarded proportionally to their bids, and this was a very um, a very um, bad characteristic of the fixed rate tenders because this sets incentives for immoderate demand accelerations um, over time. So bidders um, continuously increase their demand of money um, and it, at the end it was just just immoderate so that um, something like a solution um, was, uh, was needed. And then the variable rate tenders were introduced where not um, a fixed interest rate was given, but a minimum interest rate of, for example, 2.5%, um, which was pre-announced by the European Central Bank. And then the bank didn't submit only a one-dimensional bid, but a two-dimensional bid, which was representing first their demand of money, so a certain amount of money, but also their offered interest rate. And then the bids are were ordered by decreasing interest rate offers and awarded until the demand of money meets supply. So we didn't have the case of demand exceeds supply and we had to somehow award the bidders um, uh, yes, in this situation. So the switch from fixed to variable tender solves the overbidding problem. So from a general perspective, the options for refinancing operations, um, yeah, we have the good specification here again. This is a kind of liquidity which is optioned, and these are homogeneous goods, because money is a homogeneous good. And we have rather short-term contracts here because the um, the um, the interest rate was valid for two weeks. And then we had the goals of uh, efficiency, maximization of revenue, which is quite clear meanwhile, but also we have the goal of signaling and controlling. So the minimum interest and the volume auction should set a kind of signal, so a signal of liquidity of the market. Um, so we also have uh, the goal of uh, discovery of liquidity needs. Um, market conditions in this case um, are a very large number of bidders, so from the financial sector, so we had a huge competition, a very highly competitive situation, which was very um, favorable for, for the auction and all of the asymmetric information. Um, from the auction format, it's a auction which is run from the central bank and it's a repeated auction that took place every week. Um, here we also have a sealed bid auction with interest volume bids, which is either a paid bid or a uniform price auction. So that means the, the auction format changes um, 
changes um, yeah, over time. Auctions here in the refinancing operations are also an uh, international standard. Compared to the renewable energy uh, case, we have a completely different good, but we have um, kind of similar goals um, in case of efficiency and discovery, but also in case of signaling and controlling, because in the renewable energy option, bidders will learn from um, previous options for subsequent ones, because they are uh, repeated options. Then we um, have the market conditions, which are quite different. We have here a very large number of bidders and a very high uh, competition, which is not definitely the case in the renewable, renewable energy uh, context. Yes, then we have all of that asymmetric information as always, and the repeated option, which is one of the similarities here. So for the conclusion, traditional feed and tariff without caps may lead to uncontrolled deployment, which may be more than targeted by policymakers. And auctions can help making the support in feed and tariffs more efficient through a competitive price setting. I think this argument is quite, quite obvious and refers to the two examples in the beginning of this, of this case. Um, further, in highly competitive markets, the use of either pay a bid or uniform pricing is negligible. So it doesn't matter if we have pay bid or uniform pricing, if we have a high level of but first, this high level has ha have to be given. Um, now we come to the last example, the options for gas and oil leases. Um, these are a specific kind, um, a spe specific uh, format of auction, as we will see during this example. So we assume that uh, one offshore oil lease is optioned for a predetermined tract. So this is done by a first price here bid auction, and we may have three potential buyers. Then the amount of oil related to the tract, the actual value of the oil lease, is uncertain before the auction. But bidders are allowed to do seismic investigations of the tract before bidding. That is, they can have a certain estimation of, of the value of the, of, of the lease. So the three bidders have the following ex ante estimations regarding the value of the oil lease. The first estimates the value of $24 per acre, the second of, 20, uh, of $32, and the third of $34. Then they submit the following bid. They do bid trading here because we have a first price here bid option, and consequently submit the bid 23, 31, and uh, 32. But they still do not know the actual value of the oil lease. However, the actual value of the oil lease is $30 per acre. So um, this is, if you if you know this plan, I don't, I don't know if it's, if it's important for you. This is um, this is exactly the the average of the estimation. So $30 is the actual value of the oil lease, and Bidder 3, who submitted the highest bid, will be awarded, but this is automatically this bidder who overestimated the value of the oil lease the most. So he wins the auction and pays his bid, which was 32, and unfortunately his bid was higher than the actual value of the oil lease of $30. Um, so consequently, he realizes a negative profit after being awarded. And this situation is called the winner's curse. So from a good specification, uh, we have several tracks for oil and gas um, leases, which are auctioned. And the most important here, so the, the, the reason why the winner's curse uh, can occur is the common value approach. So all bidders um, do not know the exact value of the um, oil uh, lease before the auction. And they will only 
have the possibility to really um, see the true value after being awarded, and this can be already too late. So, um, awarded firms have five years to explore the track, and only after this five years, bidders would know if they have overestimated or underestimated the track. But as always, the highest bidder is uh, awarded in a first price auction. The, um, the risk that the winner overestimated the um, value the most is very, very high. As goals here, we have effectiveness, maximization of revenue, and efficiency. So these are more or less the main goals of auctions. We have market conditions, which are uh, quite important because information in this common value auction is very important. So we have a first an asymmetric information between auctioneer and bidder, but we also have asymmetric information here among bidders. So neighbor firms, for example, will have better information about the track than others. And consequently have advantages in, in, in by, by bidding. Um, finally, the auction format. Um, so the U.S. Department of Interior conducts the auction, and it's a simultaneous first price bid auction, where the uh, minimum bids are announced before. Compared to the renewable energy support uh, case, we have quite a lot of uh, similarities, but only if we um, assume the common value. So the common value approach applies to the renewable energy support context in case projects developed by government are offered up for bidding. So only in this case. In all other cases, this might be non-relevant from a lessons learned perspective. The risk of winners is crucial in situations with high common value components because first the expansion target may be at risk because bidders could not finalize um, the project. Um, the support level is not cost covering, and bidders could finally get discouraged over time. So um, I would just go briefly over the last slide. So the lessons learned for ORIS. First, auctions are highly sensitive to market and framework conditions, as well as auctioneers' goals. I think this became clear during the webinar. Um, Auctions are already a well-established tool for industry and policy. So auctions are not a new invention in this uh, form because there are all, already a lot of laws postulating the implementation of auctions. So they are successfully used in, in several um, sectors already. Um, finally, although general lessons learned should be considered with caution, first insights for particular design options may offer a valuable approach for the ORIS project. So um, I think we should briefly um, go to your questions if you have some. I just check the chat. Okay, I see one question, which is a quite long one, so I have first to read it. I think I should read the question out loud to you. So, um, in many auctions, for example, in the procurement auction example, the best fitting auction design becomes apparent first after all bids are submitted and the best combination can be determined. Yes, that's, that's correct. So, you have to anticipate the bidding behavior in, in some kind 
Um, but an auctioneer has to foresee the bidding behavior of the participants and base the design on this. The only possibility I see for that, especially in case of renewable energy support auctions, would be to perform simulated auctions during the, during the design stage. Do you think it can be a good idea to perform several concrete simulated auctions with maybe different auction formats in one country, or do you think this would reveal too much information to participants before the actual auction? All right. So, of course, it's, it's difficult in situations like the renewable energy support um, case to anticipate the bidding behavior. So, it might be um, useful to, to change the auction format over time. However, I think it, it would make no sense to just try several um, auction formats in order to, to gather um, different uh, information about the bidding behavior. I think the renewable energy um, context already provides a certain uh, clear um, understanding of, of market conditions and goals so that we only have a more or less limited, um, limited uh, scope of possible auction formats. So the most discussed in the renewable energy support context are, for example, the pay bid and the uniform pricing. And if you have, for example, multi-project bidders, so bidders that participate with multiple goods, um, multiple projects in the auction would submit multiple bids. For example, the uniform price auctions is um, less favorable than than the than the um, these bid ones because there you have incentives to to coordinate your bids. But um, this is just an example. So I think in the renewable energy support context, you would be able to, um, to find um, essential market conditions that will lead to a specific auction format. However, you should, um, you should um, be open to, to change the, the auction format if you would, would uh, reveal, I don't know, a very bad auction, auction outcome. So, of course, it depends on the situation and the market conditions will be changed over time. So, you cannot say this is the, the best auction format you can, you can uh, conduct over, over time. But I think there are already in, in the renewable energy support market very specific conditions to be um, incorporated in an appropriate auction format where we only have not so many alternatives. I'm not sure if I see further questions, maybe in the question and answer. So I think we are already running out of time. So if you would like to ask a question, please do so now. Okay, then I think I, I should come to an end. So, if you are interested in uh, further reading, um, you will find some uh, literature um, at the end of the presentation. Um, otherwise, I would like to say a thank you to all of you and sorry for having too less time for, for questions. Um, please feel free to, to contact me um, if you have any further urgent questions. Um, otherwise, I would like to um, inform you about um, the upcoming webinars, which you will also find on our webpage. So thanks for listening and
have a good week.